Tango Banter. I am Elisaveta, and I'm so happy to have you with me for the next few minutes. This episode, I've decided to make it a part two to my last episode, where I talked about more of the, about the technical qualities that help to uh, advance your dance that you can be focusing on. And I mentioned in the last episode that in order to be a, well, to feel like a popular dancer, to be satisfied um, as a social tango dancer, there are two sides to our endeavor. One is the technical side. The other one's the social side. And it might, I might find out... (laughs) that this is a can of worms that is much bigger than I anticipate, but I'm willing to take that risk because talking about the social aspect of tango is very important for us. Uh, We forget about that as dancers, that it's not just about our technique or our experience or our musicality. We can be excelling in all of those areas and still have a very hard time at the milonga. In fact, over the years, I have met so many dancers who've left tango, who've quit. And I believe outside of a few cases where it's because the dancers are um, moving somewhere or they move somewhere where they, there's not enough tango or they decide to start a family so they don't have time uh, to dance. Outside of those few cases, the majority, the overwhelming majority of cases of dancers leaving tango is because of social reasons. Uh, and I would say the most common one I hear is that dancers are um, not able to make significant connections with people and make friends and so they feel like an outsider and they get frustrated Uh, many of them are fine dancers even and yet they still have a really hard time getting dances that they want or the quality of dances that they desire so to solve this dilemma requires us to look at a broader context of of what is it that's so difficult for us socially when we um, have to go into a communal space and interact with other people. Why is it pretty easy for some people and they have no problem and then other people really struggle? So I want to share a little bit of my experience with this and um, I guess share a few points that I feel helped me along the way. And of course, I'm curious for those of you who resonate with this topic and who have your own experience to share, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to me on social media at I'm So Tango, um, Facebook or Instagram, or email me at connect at I'm So Tango.com. So most people don't believe me when I say that I am an extremely introverted person. (laughs) Uh, I'm extremely introverted and shy person. Actually, I'm, I'm a, what is it that somebody said? A functioning introvert. And it is uh, very common for me to hear from other dancers, tango dancers, that they're also very introverted. And in fact, In some way, I think tango is sort of therapeutic or can have a therapeutic effect on introverted people. It's um, sort of a a way for introverted people to have a a dose of social interaction without too much investment and being able to leave whenever they want and 
it's kind of like you can you can have solitude in a crowded space kind of feeling so tango attracts a lot of people who are more introverted who are a little bit more awkward socially uh, and that's a gift that, that tango offers and I think that's awesome however it's also very challenging I remember I think I've mentioned this in one of my episodes that when my doctor uh, found out that I was uh, a tango dancer the first thing she said was oh, I, could, I could never do that and and I said why <laughs> and she was like I just cannot fathom the idea of sitting and waiting to be asked to dance and if you know if I don't get a dance and what that means and so there's a lot of uh, anxiety for people outside of tango even thinking about what it what it involves and then when new dancers come on the scene rarely do they get a um, transitional experience from a class setting to a full-on malanga setting it's I mean it, it seems like most people just start taking beginner classes and then they just start going to the malanga and for some people that's a huge jump and it's very difficult to all of a sudden be in the social space with a very um, strict uh, etiquette and behavior and you know asking and being rejected and chasing after dances it's it's very disorienting so in my own experience looking back you know tango is kind of like high school <laughs> um and i've i've had i've had other people tell me that they feel the same i feel like when we're teenagers in high school it's when we start to have to negotiate for our space in the community and figure out where we fit in. And it seems like wherever we were, and I, I don't know, this is my perception, so if, if you disagree, I would love to know what you think. But it seems like wherever we were in high school, however we managed to cope with the stresses of dealing with popularity contests or being included or being you know counted or visible whatever it's like that's what we've carried into adulthood um, and some people get a chance to uh, develop that further if they get involved with um, tight-knit communities and working relationships that help them to kind of grow but for a lot of us you know it's very much that uh, we were a certain way during high school. We, we learned certain um, strategies and coping mechanisms. And those are the mechanisms that we have available at the time that we go into tango. So if we, if we didn't learn how to feel safe and accepted by a group of unknown people, or if we didn't develop social skills to make the transition easier then of course it's going to be very hard because all we know is that feeling of whatever degree of isolation we might have felt during our teenage years so th that's what happened to me I being an immigrant uh, and also just naturally being more quiet and shy it was very difficult for me to feel okay I had a very difficult time in social situations where I didn't know people. Um, I was very scared of, of kind of strangers. And when I started being in more adult situations um, through my work as an artist and having to attend uh, gallery openings and networking events and things like that, I had a tremendously difficult time. And so much so that I had panic attacks, social panic attacks, which would basically look like this. I'd go in and I would start having this voice in my head that would tell me that there's something wrong with me, either the way I look or something about me is just strange and everybody knows it and everybody's looking at me and nobody wants to talk to me because... 
I don't fit in and I'm too weird and everybody else is, you know, okay and I'm not. And this voice just would amplify and just, just go into this overdrive to the point where I would start having a little bit of like heart palpitation and I would have to go to the bathroom and sort of just breathe and kind of walk myself off the ledge and focus. There were a few times that I, I would just, I actually like almost blacked out because I was like hyperventilating in a bathroom stall. <laughs> and um, it was uh, very difficult to function as an adult with this. So when I came to Tango, this is what my starting point was. So my panic attacks were pretty regular. My first Tango class, I ended up going to the bathroom with a panic attack. It wasn't that bad, but I was, I was mortified. I never wanted to go back, uh, but somehow I did, thankfully. Uh, so it took a long time for me to learn to work with it, to manage it. And I'm grateful that, that Tango provides such a context that's, uh, you know, it's consistent, right? Like if you, if you start dancing, you're going regularly, hopefully. I mean, I did, I, I started going regularly. So week in, week out, you know, you just kind of keep going and little by little your experience starts to shift um at least it did for me so that time that i spent just going and pushing myself a little bit at a time and just being able to do what i could over years i developed skills to help me manage this and it's not like i actually got over it fully um even though now i experience it very rarely I was really humbled last week because I experienced the full force of it once again. Uh, I went to a wedding and it was my boyfriend's friends, the, his former co-workers and people that he knew. And I was really looking forward to this wedding. I was excited about being there and meeting new people. But I tell you, when I walked in to this little back room of a restaurant filled with people I did not know they were and they were all like in my eyes super fancy and beautiful and amazing you know like <laughs> I felt all of it all at once I just came in and there was just this uh, looming terror in my mind the first thing I wanted to do, I swear to God, I walk in and the first thing I want to do is leave. I was like, never mind. I don't want to be here. I, I was desperate. I felt like I wanted to find a place to hide. Um, I even thought about catching an Uber to go home. I, I mean, it was crazy. And because I hadn't felt it in such a long time, there was a part of me that's like, seriously, <laughs> still? So... I ended up, you know, having this really interesting night where all of these things that I thought I was done with, that I thought I have overcome and have become a different person, um, they're not gone. They're still there, right? Um, that quality, that, that nervousness and that fear of not being accepted, not being cool enough, it's still there. But... What I do have now, which I didn't before, something that I believe I've earned over the years, it's not something that you just luck into, not something that somebody can give you or sell to you, it's something that you have to earn, and that's confidence. Confidence, in my eye, is not a thought, it's not a thought, a, a, a thinking process. But confidence is a tool bag, an internal tool bag that you have ready for the moment when you need to be 
faced with something that you're really afraid. And I guess it could also be called courage, you know, but courage to me seems like, you know, an extreme version, that, you know, something that courage to overcome something, but confidence is, is just this commitment to use the tools and not to give in to the, the voices in your head, right? Um, so I'll tell you what I did, which is kind of funny. I, um, you know, I had to walk the walk. I had to actually apply the lessons that I preach. Um, I couldn't leave. I couldn't allow myself to leave. I was like, there's no way, there's no way I could do this. So what did I do? I went to the bathroom. <laughs> That's my strategy. And, and this place had a really nice bathroom that was painted bright blue, like a very kind of saturated, uh, beautiful, bright blue. And it had this black and white floor. And I just went into a stall and I sat and I just breathed and you know, all of, uh, there was all these like voices in my head. What, what are you going to do? You know, it's like all this urgency, right? But I just sat there and I was like, okay, okay. You know, like it's okay. Right. And so I took about five minutes and then I uh, went back inside. And the thing that I really feel awkward about is when I don't have anything to do and nobody to talk to, right? I'm sure other people feel this awkwardness, right? Especially when you go in and you don't know anyone and maybe you don't have any in, anything in common, especially if you don't have anything in common. So I, um, I just said to myself, like, that I'm just going to allow myself to stand there even if nobody talks to me. Like, I, I'm, I'm just going to put myself into a spot and not move from there. That was my task. And it was kind of like a stamina exercise. Like how long could I just stay there and, and, and be okay with the fact that people might be looking at me as the weird person. That lasted about 20 seconds because I got into a conversation with someone. And then um, the conversation was, you know, fairly enjoyable. And, and, I, and I was like watching myself and I was like, oh, Okay, yeah, that, I can, I can carry on a conversation with somebody who doesn't know me and doesn't know what I do. So, you know, that's like that kind of an experience is what builds confidence, right? Because it's like you have this moment of panic, and then you make it through that panic. And as you're aware of making through that panic, then you're like, okay, this is not so bad. So that builds your toolbox, that builds your confidence. So. Later in the night, I um, ended up getting a drink spilled on me, which is uh, was a drag because I don't know why I tracked this, but this is like the third time in the past couple of months that I've had a full drink spilled on me. So I was kind of mad, and I was not in good mood anymore. And um, part of the the uh, wedding party was taking place outside in the parking lot, and after I cleaned off my dress in the bathroom, yes, I did go and sit in the stall again because I was just so pissed that it happened, but whatever. I went outside and it was one of those situations where all the tables had some people sitting at them and chatting. There were some people standing, chatting. I didn't know anyone or knew people very remotely. And um, there was an area that was kind of like this long bench and it was very kind of visible you know it was just kind of around in everybody's eyesight you know range and so I sat down and I was having this feeling of like oh my god I have nobody to talk to everybody sees and knows that I'm feeling awkward so my first response was to get my phone out and and look at my phone but then I caught myself and I'm like, again, that's like, that's just a strategy to deal with the discomfort, the awkwardness, the feeling of like, 
oh, somebody's going to know that I'm, that I'm not talking to anyone. <laughs> and um, again, I, I sort of decided in, the, in this moment, like, put the phone away, stop fidgeting, and just sit there and observe what's happening. Just, like, be aware of the fact that you're feeling very uncomfortable and then be aware of other people and what they're doing and be aware of the the temperature around you and you know i just really kind of force myself to to own up to the fact that reality is happening reality is that i'm sitting alone my dress is soaked and nobody's talking to me and i'm not having a good time but I'm going to sit here and I'm going to act and pretend like this is exactly what I want happening right now. I'm going to just show that I don't need anything different. I don't need to be on my phone. I don't need to fidget. I don't need to look for an escape route. I can just be here, you know, in, in this uncomfortable place. Uh, that lasted about two minutes before, you know, I was whisked away. And within 10 minutes, I was sitting in a group of new people to me, making friends. And, and then the night kind of like completely transformed. And I ended up having some meaningful exchanges with people and even dancing some tango for them, which was pretty fun. So ultimately... You know, I had this whole night to um, to explore these ups and downs. You know, this roller coaster. You go from having a good time, I'm having a terrible time, I'm having a great time, <laughs> and and that's how t milongas are. You know, a lot of times milongas are just this a whole like miniature lifetime of drama that can unfold in different degrees, right? And you can go in and you can have a terrible time, and then it turns around and you have a great time and um, you know sometimes you make the decision to leave like I you know I've I've done that I've done many many on many occasions I would go in and I felt this you know charge this urgency and this panic and I would listen to it and I would leave and it would provide me with a reprieve from that right I could I could go away and I could be safe. And there are still times when I actually need to do that. There are times when I'm at a milonga and I just feel like I cannot be there. There's something that's really bothering me. I'm in a really bad mood and I just have to get up and leave. And that's fine. But sometimes it's a good exercise to just stick with it. You know, to stick with the discomfort because there is a chance that it might turn around. So I was thinking about what were the things that were the most useful for me to, to do and to think about when I was going through this experience last weekend. And, you know, reflecting on what strategies I use now because I definitely feel um, that I do get... For the most part, I do feel very happy about my connection to the community, and I um, I feel pretty at ease whenever I go to Milonga, whether I know people or not. And I so I feel like I've succeeded in getting to the level of interaction and, and connection that I've wanted. And um, how I got there is what I feel like I'm reflecting on, and what are the what are the strategies that have proved uh, most helpful? So I'm going to share just the tip of the iceberg, a few, a few thoughts here for you to chew on and reflect on and, and tell me. Tell me what, what you feel um, about this, how you relate to this, and whether this is something you think um, is useful or, or there are other strategies that help you. So... <clears throat> One of the number one thing is allowing the negative or the bad thing to occur. So, you know, a lot of times when we go to a new 
social environment uh, in terms of tango. If we go to Milonga, we've never been to. There's all this fear. Oh my God, what if nobody talks to me? What if nobody asks me to dance? Um, there's so much anxiety that just that anxiety itself might actually create what we are afraid of because we're just primed to look for proof of what we're afraid of, you know? So the first trick is to acknowledge that that's possible. You might go in and nobody might not might talk to you. Like you might go in and you might not know anyone. And uh, you don't have to do anything about it. Just go in. Just go in, sit down, just be there. Don't try to protect yourself against it. Don't try to save yourself. Don't try to um, cover up or hide the fact that nobody's talking to you or nobody's dancing with you. And that in itself is a huge challenge. I have a, a dear friend of mine whose challenge right now is to, uh, as they say, to just sit at the milonga and not dance every tanda because for them, they're dancing because they're, they're afraid. They're afraid not to be dancing. They're afraid to just sit and, and not, uh, not be dancing a tanda. So it's a worthwhile exercise to sometimes, even if you know that you do have the opportunity to, to escape your solitude, you know, but from time to time, just give yourself that room to experience it because it, there's, it's kind of banal. It's not that big of a deal. Like I'm thinking the next day, if somebody like looks back on a night, will they be like, oh, remember so-and-so? Nobody danced with them. Nobody talked to them. Like, nobody's really aware of that. So it's not a huge deal if you go in and you're kind of, you know, not being the visible most popular dancer. Um, it's okay. In fact, um, you know, the second part of this is... You know, it's, it's a little bit more advanced in certain ways because you kind of have to, like, really believe in it. But just pretend that's what you're intending to do. I'm telling you, just, just pretend that that's exactly what you want. Okay? Even though on the inside, you might have that voice telling you something's wrong, something's wrong. People think you're weird. But if there's a little bit of you know, fake it till you make it. But, you know, it's kind of like you're putting on a role. Imagine you're, you're being cast in a film and you're being asked to act a certain way. And so you're putting on a role. And the role is that you're really enjoying doing exactly what you're doing. You don't need to talk to anyone. If nobody's talking to you, you don't need to be asked to dance. You're enjoying exactly the place where you are. I tell you, this is such a powerful place to come from it is a magnet it's like an energetic magnet and I'll tell you a funny story that I um, use as my uh, almost my philosophical uh, philosophical standpoint on life one day I I was at a uh, Oregon Country Fair one day it's a great event uh, in Oregon and um, it was lunchtime, and I, I got this little salad from a truck. There was nothing special about the salad. It was just a little bit of lettuce, some tomatoes. I was in a very good mood, and I didn't have anybody with me. I was by myself. And I just decided to do this social experiment. I don't know why I decided to do this, but it was just appropriate. Maybe because I somehow now I seek out, sometimes I seek out opportunities to kind of push myself, push my comfort zone. So I sat eating a salad. Now I sat with very like upright posture and I was eating this salad and I was really savoring it. And I decided that I was going to make eye contact with people as they passed by. And I would just smile at them. I'd be eating my salad and I would smile at them and they would 
you know, keep going. It was really fascinating to see the reaction because some people just like saw me looking at them and looked away immediately. Other people looked at me, looked away, but then looked back to see if I was really looking at them. Other people smiled back. But then after a few minutes, a fascinating thing started happening. People started coming up to me and saying, what are you eating? <laughs> that happened about four times in a span of 10 minutes that it took me to finish my salad. People would come up and be so curious about what I was eating. And then some people actually bought the salad. But the lesson was that there was nothing special about this salad. It was me, my energy, and that I was really savoring this experience and I was really enjoying myself. So my code phrase for this is, are you eating your salad? <laughs> so if you ever hear me mention that phrase, you'll know what I'm referring to. So when you are in a place, difficult place, think about that. Can you sit and eat your salad and just enjoy, have that air of enjoyment on your face, smile, look around you, look like you're curious, um, pay attention to something. And, and that actually brings me to the third, my third final point is focus on something outside of yourself. You know, all this energy inside your head is like, you know, it's just going, going, but when you put a, put yourself to the task of having to put on a persona and put on this role that you're enjoying yourself, then you're going to have to give your mind something to focus on other than what's inside. Mm -hmm. So you look around and you find something. Maybe you look at someone's dress and you appreciate what that looks like. And you think, Oh, those shoes, I wonder what those shoes are. Oh, I wonder what the music is, you know, and, and this will totally transform your, your energy, the way people perceive you. And it makes you really attractive to others. And it makes you kind of magnetic. People can't stay away from that energy. And I say that I, I've tested it many times. And whenever I want people to stay away from me, I will turn that off. I will just go in a corner and I will be very quiet and I don't do that. And there are times when I don't want attention. That's totally, yeah, that happens. But if I'm in a new place and I'm feeling all sorts of fears and insecurities and I want to attract people and I want to sort of be taken into the flow of the milonga and meet new people and dance, then those, this is what I do. I just kind of take on this task of, first of all, acknowledging how I feel, being uncomfortable, you know, feeling that, that sense of urgency, that wanting to escape. And then I kind of choose uh, some sort of like a facade, a, a, a role. You know, I imagine Marilyn Monroe a lot. Marilyn Monroe is so gifted at that. She was so profoundly talented when it came to um, her attractiveness and being able to uh, manage her insecurities in public. She was an extremely insecure person, but you wouldn't know that, right, by looking at her. Um, and so once you have that that task, like you're, you're going to pretend, you're going to put this on, you're going to invoke that feeling that you're really having a good time. You look for a focus outside yourself. You look for something that will support that feeling. Uh, and it can be whatever gives you a feeling of appreciation and curiosity. Um, I'm curious if, if you do end up trying this, I'm curious what happens for you because typically it takes about minutes. It takes minutes. Within minutes, somebody starts talking to me or something happens or something. somebody asks me to dance. Like I get kind of swept up into the experience very quickly. Uh, so that would be 
something you can try if you struggle with that, if you struggle socially and you have a difficult time overcoming those fears, especially if you're like me and you have some more introverted qualities and a little bit more shyness. You don't have to work hard to go out and search out and, and kind of weasel your way into groups of people and, and, and get people to be friends with you. Like you don't have to do any of that. You can just attract it to yourself because there are a lot of people who are not like you and me. Uh, there are people who are extremely extroverted and they all they want is to talk to new people. My boyfriend is actually like that. And sometimes it, it's very uncomfortable because we're so different when it comes to our energy that way. He'll go in and he'll, on purpose, just go up to strangers and start conversations and get curious about them and ask them questions. So there are people who naturally have developed those qualities. It just kind of comes to them. And they're looking. They want to connect with new people. And so you are just making yourself available for that. And a lot of times, guess what? Those people, those extroverted people, they are connectors. The way Malcolm Gladwell uh, in his book, The Tipping Point, talk about connectors, you know, there are certain people who just connect with people and they know people. So once you connect with one or two of these people, they will introduce you to other people and then you're just kind of, you don't have to worry about it. You'll just kind of get swept up into, into your own little pod. And you don't have to be part of, um, you know, the whole community of Tango. You don't have to be friends with everyone. You just need to find your own little pod of people that serve as your anchor, that you are excited to see when you go to the Milonga. They are going to be the reason for you to go to dance a lot of times. Um, I know that's true for me. A lot of times I'll make my decision to go dance, not based on what dancers are going to be at the Malonga, like the quality of dancing. I'll make it based on which of my friends are going to be there. So uh, those are the little tidbits that I can share with you at this point. I hope that they are inspiring uh, on some level. And of course, please share with me as you uh, mull over some of these ideas and some of the thoughts that you might have in response. <sighs> Thanks so much for joining me today. And I'll see you next week at the next Tango Banter.